The capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Sarajevo, was captured by German forces during the Axis invasion of Yugoslavia in April 1941. Sarajevo, along with the rest of Bosnia and Herzegovina, became part of the independent state of Croatia, an Axis puppet state. But how did Axis rule come to an end here in Sarajevo? In this video, I'm going to talk about the partisan capture of Sarajevo. Keep watching! Prior to the Axis invasion of Yugoslavia that started on April 6, 1941, the Royal Yugoslav Army leaders had different ideas on how to protect their territory in case of an enemy attack. There was one idea to abandon 90% of the territory of the Yugoslav Kingdom and retreat in the hills around Sarajevo and make a stand there. But this plan was abandoned. I mean, giving up 90% of the territory didn't sound like a good deal. When the German-led Axis invasion of Yugoslavia started, the Yugoslav army fell apart quick. On the 15th of April, Sarajevo was captured by the Germans and two days later, an armistice was signed. The campaign had barely lasted 12 days. Die deutsche Kriegsflagge wird gehisst. In Sarajevo, hier wurde am 28. Juni 1914 der österreichische Thronfolger Erzherzog Franz Ferdinand durch das feige Attentat eines serbischen Studenten niedergestreckt. Diese Schüsse waren das Signal zum Weltkrieg. One German officer called it a military parade rather than a campaign. Sarajevo, alongside with the whole of Bosnia, became part of the NDH, the Independent State of Croatia, which was led by Anta Pavlic and his Ustasha movement. Many of the city's Serbs, Jews and Romani were killed. In 1941, the atrocities committed by the Ustasha were strongly condemned by groups of Sarajevo's citizens. As war's end, the notorious Ustasha commander Vjekoslav Luburic took office in the city and established his headquarters in the center of the city. In March to April 19. His forces killed over 300 people and hanged 55 of their corpses on trees in the city to scare the population. By now, the resistance had taken over many access controlled areas. The Yugoslav resistance group that would take over the country were the partisans, led by Joseph Brostito. The Germans were on the retreat and needed to have a good withdrawal route. Since through Serbia was no longer an option, they fought to hold the Shrem front in order to maintain the passage through Kosovo, Zanchak, and Bosnia. Mostar was evacuated on the 22nd of February. It took the partisans a while before they reached Sarajevo. They fought for some time in the Sirmian front in a battle of attrition. And that had to do that the partisans had to switch from guerrilla to regular warfare. As the German troops swarmed the city, Sarajevans felt the full effect of total war. The German and Ustasha armies co-opted the entire human and material resources of the city for the war effort. They took possession of every train, wagon, car and set of skis, leaving town officials with no means of importing food while trapping civilians who had hoped to flee. Being an important junction, Sarajevo was repeatedly bombed by the Allies, killing 100, perhaps even 1,000 refugees. From September 1944 till April 1945, the city experienced a devastating chapter with bombings and a harsh Axis occupation. This left the citizens of Sarajevo in shock. In January 1945, the German HQ was moved out of the city. A number of 35,000 soldiers were left in the city. Cities near Sarajevo, Mostar, Visegrad, and Travnik were taken by the partisans. Early February, the partisans mapped out Operation Sarajevo. Mid-February, Hitler ordered troops to hold a firm grip on the city. He declared Sarajevo a festoon, a fortress city that had to hold out till the last man. He appointed General Heinz Katna as the city's commander. And Anta Pavlic had appointed Luburic as the city's commander. And Luburic, he unleashed a reign of terror against Sarajevo's citizens. On the 1st of March, 1945, the partisans unleashed Operation Sarajevo. As the partisans took up positions the hillside, Local resistance groups committed acts of sabotage in the city. Ustasha commander Luburic had many of them arrested and killed. The partisans came closer and closer to the city. On the 16th of March, Luburic and fellow commanders came together and they renewed their vows to the independent state of Croatia and were willing to go down with it. They denounced the Yalta Conference, denounced Bolshevism and denounced the Tito government in Belgrade. A handful of Muslims continued their support but they were very well aware that the independent state of Croatia was going down and they would go down with it if they continued their support 
to it. Now the local archbishop and other Catholics, they believed that they had to continue the fight as they saw communism as a greater evil, but they soon fled the city. Despite the situation's hopelessness, the arrests and trials of friends and neighbors and the exodus of people close to the regime, a handful of committed local leaders continued to impress upon their communities the importance of maintaining their institutions and keeping some semblance of Sarajevo's civic cultural life. On the 20th of March, Hitler approved to evacuate the city. The Germans had barely any supplies left and many wounded to evacuate. Local skirmishes increased and the partisans came closer and closer to the city and were eventually able to target a vital German infrastructure. While the Germans were trying to make their way out, Ustasha commander Luburic executed a final round of terror on the 27th of March. 85 people were hanged. And there were signs put around their necks saying long live the Poglovnik, the leader, meaning Ante Pavlic. Near the end of March, the German evacuation was almost complete as the partisans closed in on the city. On the 4th of April, Luburic left as well. He left 350 Ustasha policemen and 400 Ustasha soldiers to put up some resistance against the partisans. They blew up an oil depot near a factory killing nine people and the next day the Germans completed their evacuation as the Ustasha covered the rear. In the last hours of the occupation 20 members of the city's small communist corps including the party secretary Vladimir Peric also known as Walter were killed. In the next day some street fighting occurred but these were local skirmishes so yeah you can barely call it the battle of Sarajevo. On the 6th of April 1945 the partisans entered the city and they encountered a devastated city full of starving and frightening people. However, while the townsmen welcomed the exit of the Axis troops and the end of terror, first-hand partisan reports paint a less glowing picture. The first partisan officers on the scene noted the city's apprehensiveness as the communists arrived and described the population stunned by the final weeks of Ustasha terror. Although many Sarajevans were elated to be freed of the stranglehold of the Ustasha regime, the agonizing search for missing loved ones and the exhumation of freshly dug unmarked graves dampened spirits. The new communist rulers made use of the situation as they established a party apparatus. They arrested collaborators and many of them were killed. Within a year the Sarajevo masses enthusiastically embraced their new socialist community and its leader Tito. The horrors of the occupation and the Ustasha terror made them search for something to believe in and Tito gave them hope. Thanks to my patrons, you see their names on the screen right now and a special thanks to Nick Terranova, Rainy Bechtel, Thomas Abiega, Damian Wallace, Connor, Philip Jordan, Marcus Kaas, Nick Terranova, Haley, Mark Little Hill, Jan Jozinkiewicz, Joan, Justin Tabell, Tanya Dixie, Henry Clarkson, Rob Park, Andrea Martic, Susanna Di Bella, John Peach, Fabrizio, Wayback History, Fernando Lopez Ojeda, Mike West and Franz. The partisan capture of Sarajevo can be considered as a Forgotten World War II battle. I made a whole series on these type of battles. If you're interested, click here. I want to thank you for watching. Best wishes from Sarajevo.